I'm uh, David Nuremberg, the director of this place, the best job in the world with the best commute. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen that alley of trees that separates my house from my office. Um, and I want to thank you for joining me here in this ceremony of brief ceremony, well, relatively brief. Never trust <laughs> anyone who has a podium when they say brief. Uh, relatively brief ceremony of welcome. Uh, to welcome you here to this marvelous place. Uh, the anthropologist Victor Turner, who was a member here in 1975 to 1976, I'm only going to cite members. I'm never going to talk about anyone who wasn't at the Institute for Advanced Study. That's like, and I encourage you to do the same. Uh, he pointed out that many societies mark those moments uh, when we stand at a threshold between one thing and another, he called them ceremonies of betwixt and between. Uh, he also called them liminal moments because of the Latin limen, threshold. And many societies mark such moments with rituals. And uh, if he had wanted to include amongst these rituals of betwixt and between, he might have included the long tradition of commencements that mark the beginning of academic years at universities and the graduations that mark their end. So we're not a university. And apart from tea, we have very few traditions for an institution that's actually approaching 100 years old. It's, it's amazing we have so few. So I think it really is appropriate to honor with a ceremony our collective entrance into a new year and a new community. A lot of significant philosophy has been offered on these kinds of moments. John Dewey in the early 20th century, it, offered his aims of education at a commencement in the University of Chicago. Giambattista Vico, the great uh, Neapolitan philosopher in the 1690s, offered no less than six discourses on humanism uh, at these kinds of events. I don't aspire to anything so weighty. You don't have to run away. Um, I'm going to simply attempt to describe what it is that we're celebrating. So what is that? Well, I think every one of you and every member of this community is going to have a different answer to that question. But from my point of view, we're celebrating our entry, or for some of you, our return, to a very peculiar space and temporality, a space of thought and a time of mind. We're entering a place whose space time, I've been infected by my physics colleagues, is different from that of the normal world in that it is entirely dedicated to the possibilities of thought, and specifically to the possibilities of your thought and discovery. It's easy enough to sense the distinctiveness of the space. I don't just mean our residences, our offices, our dining hall, our, 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 our uh, common room, our schools, which are all designed to hold us together with the potential for both solitude and encounter and to insulate us from the immediate demands of the world. There is no place on earth where you can spend so much time without ever leaving and still find everything you need as the Institute for Advanced Study. But I also mean the roughly 600 acres of field, forest, and meadow that shelter us from the business of the everyday world of utility and action, and that replace the purposeful lines and angularities of that world with a fractal leafiness and winding paths that invite, I'm going to say, peripatetic cogitation. In fact, the early Institute faculty, think Oswald Veblen, Albert Einstein, they actually blazed the trails themselves and they chopped the firewood. There was a firewood committee of the faculty and members at the Institute in its early days. The darkness of the night sky the presence of frogs, fox, and deer, bluebirds and orioles, even the circling turkey vultures uh, that, uh, and the occasional bald eagle all help us feel that the space of the Institute is not quite that of the world we came from and to which many of us will return. So this distinctive space of the Institute is in the service of a distinctive temporality, a uh, time of mind. The passage of time may be the most familiar and implacable feeling for us finite creatures, at, but at the Institute, we can choose to make it unfamiliar. We can bend time like a great musician bends a Bach Saraband, 
uh, to bend it away from the short-term time horizons of the everyday world. And in so doing, we can create possibilities for the kind of exploration and discovery that are only possible when we're capable of stilling the roiling and rumbling of being long enough to attend to a question that leads beyond the immediate horizons of the present. This distinctive space exists with one goal, to offer its inhabitants the opportunity to occupy that time of mind in a community capable of nourishing knowledge. The philosopher Nietzsche, who complained about a lot of things, once complained that what the, most of the world wants when it asks for knowledge is, quote, that something strange should be reduced to something familiar. He called this the error of errors because he thought the greater discovery lies in becoming aware of our most basic assumptions so that we can question them and make them strange. You're entering a community that exists to offer you the capacity for that estrangement and discovery. That's been the goal of the Institute since its founding, to assemble a collection of thinkers capable of producing through their talent, their proximity, collaboration, conversation, and diversity, insights and discoveries that could not otherwise have been produced. The founders' commitment was not to disciplinary consensus, but to what we today call viewpoint diversity, so that there could be a real testing of ideas rather than ideological or disciplinary complacency. We who are assembled here today constitute the community of thinkers for the coming year, waiting to be surprised by the direction in which our thought and the diversity of our dialogues will take us. The Institute rightly prides itself on the fields that have emerged from those dialogues and often enough between disciplines. To take one early and famous example, again, I'm only gonna talk about, well, here's an exception. I'm gonna mention a non-Institute faculty member. The economist Oscar Morgenstern and John von Neumann, so von Neumann, yes, he counts, but forget Morgenstern. Uh, they did meet over tea, but not here in the common room. They met at the Nassau Club. Nevertheless, their meeting led to their joint authorship of the theory of games and economic behavior. Their stated goal in that book was to create a new science of the psyche, to find laws like the laws of physics that could predict human behavior and to provide axioms for human desire, what they called preferences, as logically consistent as those of set theory. The result was the field of game theory, today used to think about all sorts of problems, from the possibilities of nuclear war to the dynamic pricing models given that govern more and more of our economies, from the matching of friends to kidney donations to partners on Facebook or Tinder. So as I think about the consequences of von Neumann and Morgenstern's collaboration here at the Institute for the World Today, I find myself wanting to urge you to be as promiscuous and as exogamous as possible in your own dialogues to reach out beyond your own intellectual kith and kin. That's not easy to do. So I'm gonna quote now from um, a member's report by Karen Ullenbeck and be aware that the director's only privilege is that they get to read everything in the archives. So careful what you write. But uh, she wrote in her report on the special year in geometric partial differential equations, 1997 to 98, quote, while I always hoped for some mixing at the Institute, the physicists ate at one table and the math people at another. I have no clear idea of how to influence this kind of intermingling either between the math community and outside influences or within the community itself." End quote. And then in anticipation of another visit in a later year, she wrote that her only regret about her previous visits was not having spent enough time talking to members from other disciplines, a regret she now hoped to remedy. I urge you not to wait, but to take advantage of the intimacies of our community and to cultivate those conversations and encounters that have the capacity not only to confirm, but also to transform our assumptions and hence our worlds. Let me offer an example. What if instead of stumbling upon a mathematically inclined Viennese circle economist, 
Morgenstern, von Neumann had chanced upon his colleagues and fellow German-speaking refugees, the art historian Erwin Panofsky and the medieval historian Ernst Kantorowicz, as they chatted under the dark sky of the Institute one February night in 1952, after an evening at the movies. So you have to picture these two Institute professors looking up at the stars over the Institute. Kantorowicz pronounces, looking at the stars, I feel my own futility. Replies Panofsky, all I feel is the futility of the stars. So it may not be obvious, but these two were debating the same point that Morgenstern and von Neumann had taken on, though from a different point of view. The philosopher Immanuel Kant had made a famous analogy between the laws that govern the galaxies and the laws that govern humanity. If I remember this quote, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. Kantorowicz was invoking this parallel between the laws of physics and psychology, but Panofsky's witty quip was a rebuttal of that position and a reproach to those like his colleague von Neumann, who thought that the inner life of human beings can be reduced to laws like those of physics that have helped make so much sense of the cosmos. So I can't help imagining what a conversation between Panofsky and von Neumann might have looked like. Why, why do I care? Well, I care, and for a quick answer, I'm just gonna to turn to another essay of von Neumann. I care because of our present condition. Think of von Neumann's essay published in Fortune magazine in 1955 called Can We Survive Technology? In it, he predicted that changes in weaponry, communications, and climate meant that the world needed a new political form and new ideals if it wished to avoid, quote, forms of climactic warfare as yet unimagined. That's 1955. The only recipe for surviving technological change, he concluded, was relying on what he called human qualities. But what are those qualities? What is human about them? And how can they help us achieve new ideas, new forms of life adequate to the future? To answer those always vital questions, we need the humanist and the social scientist, the mathematician and the physicist, every one of you here at the Institute to be in dialogue under this magnificent sky. This was in fact the vision of Robert Oppenheimer the Institute's longest serving director. If you've seen the movie, have, have, have you seen the movie? <laughs> then you know that Oppenheimer, like von Neumann, was consumed with the consequences for humanity of scientific progress, especially progress in the physics of the atom, whose power he had done so much to help unleash. He championed such progress. For example, he supported von Neumann's creation of the first stored program computer, which was first built under my office floor, under Oppenheimer's office floor in the basement, and then moved to what is now Crossroads Nursery. But he also thought that this approach was not enough. What are we to make of a civilization, he asked in 1959, which has always regarded ethics as an essential part of human life, and which has not been able to talk about the prospect of killing almost everybody except in prudential and game theoretical terms. Oppenheimer believed that the quote, safety of a nation or of the world, again, a quote, cannot lie wholly or even primarily in its scientific or technical prowess. If humanity wants to survive technology, to take von Neumann's phrase, he believed it needs to pay attention not only to mathematics, physics, and technology, but also to ethics, religion, values, forms of political and social organization, even feelings and emotions. He believed that the challenge of the future could only be met by bringing the technological and the human together. And he sought to make the Institute a place where these many forms of thought and aspects of humanity could come into contact in conversation. He even brought the poet T.S. Eliot here, for example. Such conversations are never easy. They weren't easy in the early years of the Institute, which was a time of economic collapse, sharp discrimination, technological transformation, think radio and cinema, increasing nationalism, displaced peoples, and the rising flames of war. It was a time in which the world of ideas, of universities, and of research was becoming a battleground. 
And it's not easy today in a world of technological change, the emergence of borders and other barriers, the rise of nationalism, war, mass migration, and renewed conflict over the nature of universities, research, and ideas. Sound familiar? All of these forces threaten to intrude into what the Institute's founding director, Abraham Flexner, liked to call this paradise for scholars. The Institute is not a paradise. It's very much of this earth, subject to its vicissitudes and dedicated to its study. But the Institute is a locus amoenus, a special place, a special in its space, in its temporality, and in its constant and consistent commitment to the value of engagement with and debate over ideas. Wherever in the world you come from, and you come from many places, and that has also always been a consistent commitment of the Institute, I trust you will agree that this special temporality, the time of mind, and this consistent and constant commitment to the testing of ideas is very rare. You may even feel that such values are increasingly under threat, even in those spaces, such as universities, built upon them. But today, you are entering a space that is dedicated to, the, to that freedom and to the possibilities of thought, as dedicated to that as any place can be. Now, like paradise, such spaces are fragile. But I do not fear for the Institute, even in these uncertain times, so long as we remain committed to the possibilities of dialogue across very different convictions and commitments. So I urge you to pursue your dialogues in any direction you wish, even if it means switching tables in the dining hall. And conversely, because the Institute cannot articulate a collective position without putting at risk the full freedom of dissent that every one of you must feel for your own possibilities of thought to thrive, the Institute Qua Institute will not issue statements or proclamations during your time here, except on matters directly related to its founding values. But I see that a welcome is threatening to become a sermon. So I'm going to conclude. And since this is a moment of betwixt and between, I will conclude in a ritual, but nonetheless heartfelt tone. May every instant of your coming year in this extraordinary space of research and learning, this space dedicated to the dialogue of ideas, even at their most difficult, bring you a renewed sense of the possibilities for your own thought and your own discovery. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the Institute. <laughs>